Well, we got a, a ministry that's visiting with us, and I love having this ministry here because it's, it's amazing to hear the testimonies and just to, to hear what God is doing among his people. Amen? So let's just, uh, let me just welcome Oren, Oren, the choir director from Brooklyn Teen Challenge to introduce his team and tell you about the ministry. Good morning, Sanctuary Fellowship. How are you guys doing today? We are excited to be here. This is a great church. I feel like I'm right at home. I might even come back. <laughs> we are always excited to come and join and, and present the ministry of Brooklyn Teen Challenge. But before I tell you a little bit about it, who is familiar with who we are, what we do, why it's called Teen Challenge, and I have a bunch of old people here? No, 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 they're not old. We actually got a pretty young crowd right now. But Teen Challenge is the faith-based solution to the drug epidemic for today. Um, it started in 1958 as a teen ministry, but it's more than that now. Uh, we don't even like to call ourselves a drug rehab because drug rehabs, you sit around in a circle and you talk about your problems, and, and we don't really do that. We focus on the solution, and that's Jesus. And because of that... Because of that, Teen Challenge boasts a success rate of something like 70, maybe 80% of those who complete the program remain drug-free five years after completing the program. And that's a God thing. In a culture where 23 million Americans are estimated to suffer from addiction and about every 19 minutes somebody dies from an overdose, it seems like drug addiction is a runaway train with no hope. It seems like there is no answer, but in the midst of a world gone mad, Teen Challenge has been a vehicle for God's grace for over 50 years to set people free from the bonds of drug addiction. Um, like I said, we are not just a rehab. Um, when, when these people come in the program, they are broken, and, and it is a miracle that they even make it to Teen Challenge. For many of them, it's because they had praying mothers and grandmothers, and, and it was so encouraging to see a baby dedication because, um, you know, if you raise a child in the ways, then he won't depart from it. And I really believe that. I really believe uh, once you hear a few testimonies, you'll know that it had to be the hand of God to part the Red Sea for them to get out of Egypt and come into the promised land. And, and some of them are still wandering in the wilderness. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But you know that there is hope. We like to say at Brooklyn Teen Challenge, hope lives here and freedom is found here, but changed lives leave here. Um, we are so excited to, to share a little bit about what God is doing. Teen Challenge, if y'all come and just line up right here. Um, we, we are obviously more than just teens. Like I said, it started as a teen program, but it was so successful in its day that now there's over 200 centers in America, um, 1,200 worldwide, and almost 200 countries. There's a waiting list of countries that want Teen Challenge to come, and many of them aren't even really that acceptable to the gospel, but they say, look, drug addiction is such a problem. If you've got something that works, then come and bring it here. Um, and and it, it became more than just a teen program. Now it's in adult centers, and, and, and I've, I've seen a lot of uh, pregnant women and children centers coming up. That's a real need right now, a place where women with children can go. So I'm excited to uh, present to you the Brooklyn Teen Challenge Choir, Trophies of God's Grace with us here today. Jesus, you're my king. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my days. I will praise you all my days. You're perfect in all your ways. You're perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. I will obey your word. I will obey your word. I want to see your kingdom go. I want to see your kingdom go. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb. Glory, glory to the Lamb. You take a 
us into the land. You take us into the land. And we will conquer in your name. We will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. I'm singing, hail, hail, light of Judah. Into the land, you take us into the land, and we will conquer in your name. We will conquer in your name, and proclaim that Jesus reigns. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. Hail, hail, light of Judah. I'd like to introduce to you one of our male students in the program, Steve. Oh, wow. <laughs> How you guys doing today? Um, wow, this church is awesome, man. Uh, you can really, uh, you know, feel that God is alive in here. So, like, anyone, you know, that maybe isn't quite all the way there yet, um, I mean, you can feel it in here, so... You know the devil's out there somewhere, like putting his head down, being like, "I can't, I can't do nothing on these guys," you know. So, uh, just really want to thank you guys for having us. Um, my man, like the worship team was great. My man said it right though, like, you know, me personally, I'm just so grateful to be here. Um, you know, just the fact to be standing upright, breathing, you know, counting my blessings. Um, you know, our our God is a uh, He's, he's a provider, man, and he's a redeemer, and he saves lives. And, um, you know, he will provide for you what you need um, if you just let him. Uh, I think uh, one of the verses, you know, I really like this one. He, he's talking about, um, you know, worrying about tomorrow and what you're going to eat. And he's like, ye of little faith. Like, why do you have so little faith? Like, come on now. Like, I, I feed the birds, you know. Why wouldn't I feed you? You know, you're my son. So... Um, just a quick little testimony. I don't really want to focus on, you know, the past because, uh, you know, really I'm looking forward, you know, I'm walking through that door, but, um, thanks. I came from, uh, a Jersey Shore, a little beach town called Manasquan, uh, I'm 29 years old. Um, I lost my father when I was 12, um, and, you know, it, I grew up with an alcoholic family, mother, father, so I really idolized it. I kind of looked up to it. Uh, I had a brother. I just loved playing sports, excelled at sports. Um, you know, really just kind of didn't really have to work hard, just, you know, partied and played sports, you know, got into college, played football. Um, things were good, but, you know, as I just continued to progress, um, I started to lose things. You know, I lost my scholarship. I got kicked off the Division One football team I was playing for. My relationship started to go. I became unemployable. Um, and I just continued to lose things, you know. And I was, I had always believed in Jesus. My mom was a, a devout Christian. But I always wanted to uh, have one foot in and one foot out. Um, there was a, a country song that said, you know, you're an angel with no halo and one wing in the fire. So, like, you're kind of just right in the middle there. Um, but... I graduated college and I realized, wow, I'm still like partying every day and drugs escalated. I broke my leg, so I started getting into opiates, which eventually, I don't know, if leads to the hard drugs. Um, so I was just, a, I was becoming a mess. Um, graduated college and, you know, people stopped partying like that and I continued. 
um, and it got worse. Began to isolate more. Um, in 2013, my mom just passed away out of nowhere from a stroke. So that like flipped my world upside down. I was cursing God. Um, happened like that. So now I had lost both my parents and I just, I, you couldn't hurt me. I felt like I was cursing God and I, you know, you couldn't hurt me. You know, I've been hurt enough, you know, the girlfriend you can go to, like, can't hurt me. And I just continued to go down that path for about three years. Um, the, the crazy thing in a scripture I like to stand on is when I came home from the hospital the day my mom had a stroke, she had the Bible open because she would read the Bible that she gave to me. I wasn't reading it, but she was in there highlighting it for one day when I picked it up, I'd be able to um, go back and see her words and her work and what she wanted me to really highlight and look at. And the one verse that was literally open when I came home that day was uh, Romans 5.3. And it's basically, you know, faith triumphs in trouble. But um, the one thing that was highlighted was, but we also glory in tribulations, um, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, and perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of the Holy Spirit has been poured out in us. Um, so, with, uh, and underneath that, in the highlighter, was, was a big amen. And uh, it was just crazy, man. And like, we have it all the plaques plaqued up because it was really special that that, you know, if that's not God, man, I don't know what is. Like, we're just lucky to be here when you think about it. And we need to really start counting our blessings. Um, anyway, I, I had ended up going into Teen Challenge. I left, didn't want to be there. I left in November. The last eight months brought me to my knees and that's where God wants us. He wants us broken so that we're, we have nowhere to go. And I was, I was crushed. Like, I, I was down to the point of, you know, really almost suicidal thoughts, almost homeless. And I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and um, he met me there, man. And he, he said, I'll help you up if you want to do this thing. And I've been back now for a little over a month, and I couldn't be happier. I've been walking around with a smile on my face. And, um, you know, these guys are my brothers. These are my sisters. And... Um, I'm just so grateful to be here. Um, you guys are really awesome. If they let us out, which they don't, I'd be back here next Sunday. But, uh, you know. I, I don't know what's in store for me. Um, we're big here on, you know, God has a plan for us. And I absolutely believe he's got a plan for every single one of you. And um, whatever your testimony is or whatever, However you got to be in these seats, you know, you can help someone else. And that's what I think our, our real calling is, is to help others, you know. And, uh, you know, just I would like to help people, maybe if it would be like young athletes um, that are getting into drugs. Because, you know, it happens when it comes with the, with the, with the uh, territory. So, you know, maybe you, I could help people that uh, were like me one day and, and let them know that, you know, that's not the road. Um, but yeah, I just appreciate you guys coming, uh, you know, coming out and listening and having us. And uh, thanks for letting me share, guys. Thank you, Steve. That's a testimony, right? We want you to know that we are here for you guys. I know that uh, that you guys support us, and we appreciate you having us back every year. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, but we want you to know that we are here for you. If you uh, saw our table on the way in, they've got these brochures, our numbers on the back. There's a little bit of information about the program inside. Um, if you're too nervous to call or, or somebody is too bashful to give us a call, check out our website. Um, we have a Friday night coffee house. It's a great way to kind of scope out the program. But um, this is the program that changed so many lives. And we want to make sure that everybody who might need one of these, or if you don't know somebody, you might know somebody who needs somebody, and that's Jesus. So pick this up on your way out. There's also a condensed version of the cross and the switchblade. This is a, a story that about how it all got started. When this book came out in the 70s, people were getting saved reading it. I read in the back of this that like, there was a lady in, the, in a foreign country that climbed in a dumpster to shoot up her last bit and was going to die. And she found this book in the dumpster, read it, and got saved. The next day, she walked by a Teen Challenge, went inside, and changed her life. So we want you to take this home. And if you want some more information about Teen Challenge, there's a clipboard back there. You can sign up your information. Our, exec our executive director, 
Pastor Russ sends out a letter every month about some testimonials and just uh, stories of victory and, and, and keeping you guys um, on, the, on the up and up about what's going on at Brooklyn Teen Challenge. Pastor, will you come join me for a second? I have something for you. Just as a token of our gratitude and a symbol of our relationship, we'd like to present you with this cross. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you, Sanctuary Fellowship, for your support of Brooklyn Teen Challenge. If you're jealous of Pastor and his cross, you can buy them for $20 at our table. <laughs> so stop by there on the way back. Uh, we want to introduce one of our ladies in the program. Cassie, will you come tell us what the Lord has done? Hi, my name's Cassandra. Um, keep it up. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, before... It uh, Brooklyn Teen Challenge. Um, I was actually in and out of facilities, in and out of jail, boot camps. Um, for eight years, I was in addiction. Uh, it led it up to marijuana. Then it just progressed to Xanax, pills, all the way up to meth. Um, I was using any chance I could. I lost control of myself, didn't know where my family was. My four-year relationship, I could even care about. Like, I just really wanted drugs. I was uh, very determined to get what I needed at the moment in that time. Um, the last time I was in jail, I had no hope. I was lost. Um, the, my bell bondsman, I broke it, so I wasn't getting out. There was definitely no hope. I thought that was the last of me. I was going to be serving time. And... Um, I just spoke to God one day in my cell. I was like, God, you know, if you're really real and you want me, like, honestly, I don't even know how I'd even say if he wanted me. I just, if he knew me, then he would get me out of it, basically. And the next day, no lie, as the Holy Spirit is my witness, the next day uh, I got out of jail and my dad was waiting for me out. Um, I didn't know exactly what was going to happen to me, but my dad said, that I was gonna go to Philadelphia Teen Challenge. And I was like, okay, I didn't know too much about Philadelphia Teen Challenge. I didn't even know where Philadelphia was, to be honest. Um, yeah, I was bad in history, right? But, um, uh, so I went to Philadelphia seven hours with my family. I got on a bus, Greyhound bus, left, went to Philadelphia, and I came in, and it was great. Um, I served 10 months in Philadelphia Teen Challenge. It was great. I learned a lot, but I didn't get what I really needed, and God knew that. I knew I still had one foot out, and I still um, was on the side of the fence. I didn't really put my full heart into serving the Lord. I was just ready to settle to go back to my house, go back to Alabama, and um, really just settle, pretty much. I, didn't, I was going to talk to the same people. Uh, maybe just not use drugs or put myself in the situation, but you know how that goes. Uh, ten months into my program, I was on, on an ongoing relationship with another woman there, and um, this is where it became real for me because uh, scriptures started becoming real. Uh, God shines every dark place with the light, and, you know, I didn't really apply scriptures to my life until that happened. And we just got a sermon Friday. You know, some of your storms will blow you to where you need to be in life. And that's, you know, whatever the enemy used for destruction, God used to bring me up. You know, and that's where Romans 8, 28 came to life. You know, every bad thing works for its good. You know, and right there I felt hopeless again. I got in the dumps. I'm like, what's wrong with me, God? I'm never going to change. You can't, I, you can't use me now. You know, I was scared. And I did anything I possibly could to run away from God. Well, no, he got me again, and he brought me to Brooklyn Teen Challenge. Um, I was upset at first. I wanted to just go and settle and go to jail, but I knew in my heart that's not where God wanted for me. And if it wasn't for God resaving me again, I would have never understood his love and his grace. And, you know, the pastor was up here talking about how love moves, and it's so true, and that's where the, all that started coming to life for me, how even though I still sinned, he still brought me out of it again. Just like in Hosea, the unfaithful wife, you know? It was, that's where Hosea speaks to me, you know? The, the wife, which was, represents Israel, which is his people, 
are so unfaithful. We are unfaithful, and God still buys us back. He still buys us back with his love. And that's where everything started coming to life. And I was like, gosh, there's a God out there, and he loves me, and he's keeping me. And um, being in Brooklyn Teen Challenge, the program's great. Sisters are great. The staff members just shower you with love. Um, my first week there, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, and then, then I knew, I was like, all right, well, my feet are stuck here. I'm stuck. And um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've been here for about seven months now. And um, the enemy is really attacking me at this time because I know he's moving me up in my program. He's moving me up and stretching me to uh, call me to bigger place in the program, which we call second phase, you know. And I know the doubt wants to come in where you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to make up to those standards. But God calls me different, you know. He says I'm ready. And um, just in this time, I just encourage everybody to just really dive into the Holy Spirit and listen to him because he's been really speaking to me. And uh, he allowed me to have a breakthrough. And the Holy Spirit is just telling me to let go of things. You know, we had a little uh, service about cutting things out of your heart. I asked to cut, get things cut out of my heart, and God instantly started working the next day. And, you know, we don't expect it how he is going to heal us, and we're like, well, that's not healing because I want it this way. You know, so sometimes it's not what we expect, and it's painful and it hurts. And I'm in that process, but he, he vindicates us at the end. He comes to our rescue, and I believe every man and woman up here are living proof of it. You know, so when you think you're at your last hopes or wit's end, God comes through and vindicates you. He pulls you out. So my uh, verse that I stand on is Psalms 41 and 2. Uh, I waited patiently on the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He, he lifted me up at the slippy, slippery pit and the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and on firm foundation. And I just want to say thank you. I love the worship. I love this church, love the love in the church. <laughs> it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you. God is in the business of restoration. He still does miracles. And here are your witnesses. We have one more song we want to sing for you today. And I'm telling you that this is one of those songs. You've probably heard it on the radio before, but if you know it, help us sing it. Because this is one of those things I tell uh, I tell the students, you got to learn how to preach to yourself before you ever can preach to anybody else. So this is one of those songs. Play it.
Thank you, Sanctuary Fellowship. We believe that, that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the one who saved us from our sins. And we thank you for partnering with Brooklyn Teen Challenge to help see lives changed for eternity. Amen. We love you guys, and this will, you guys are always welcome when you're allowed to come, when you're free to come. You guys, you guys are always welcome. You definitely know you'll get loved on here. Um, and church, right now, we're just going to, this is something, you know, we never do, but when this ministry comes, we're going to do it. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come, and we're just going to sow a seed. Amen? We're just going to sow a seed in these lives because they matter. Because we just went through a whole series, make it matter, right? We're not talking about this life matters or that life matters. We, we, we went through an entire series saying, make your life matter. And so we just want to show this team that, that we're behind them, that we love them. And so if the ushers could come and go ahead, you guys can just go ahead. And we're just going to take an offering for, for this ministry before Oren comes and shares the word with us. Amen. Are we excited for the word this morning? Come on. Come on, brother. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you guys for the warm welcome. Choir, fantastic job. We, uh, wow, so good. I always have a habit of letting the cat out the bag. And uh, I did, I, they asked me what the title of my sermon was, and I was like, well, I don't know. I didn't really come up with the title, but I, I managed to always, like, you know, let a little bit out beforehand. Uh, coffee house, we have a Friday night coffee house service. And before I ever knew what I was saying, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to preach my whole sermon in five minutes if I'm not careful. But uh, I told the choir today, I, I don't know what I do, but um, I always doubt that I can do it right beforehand. I don't know if that ever happens to you, Pastor. If you get up on Sunday morning and you've got 16 pages of notes, you've done your exegetical, whatever, homiletics, hermeneutics, and then you get up to preach and you're like, I don't know what I'm going to say. But God is faithful, and he always comes through, and this, right whenever I think that uh, I don't have anything to say, he comes through with a word. And I want to talk to you um, out of Exodus 14, so if you want to flip there. Uh, it's a familiar passage, but I want to kind of, for lack of a better word, ignore the miracle and focus on the, uh, the details surrounding the miracle. Uh, we said it again uh, today, that do it again, Lord, that we're always looking for a miracle. We're always looking uh, for God to display his miraculous strong arm to vindicate us in battle and, and to thwart the enemy. And um, no matter how many miracles the Israelites saw, it never did much to foster their faith. Uh, I don't think that anybody would describe the Israelites a people of great faith, people that were steadfast and faithful. Uh, they were a lot like us at times. Anybody ever been like an Israelite, lost in the wilderness, complaining, doubting, full of fear? Well, good. I'm in the right place then, because if not, I'd pack up and go home. <laughs> I want to read a little bit, uh, and then um, I'll, I'll stop as the Lord leads. Uh, at the beginning of 14, it says, or chapter 14, it says, Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp between here and there, for lack of knowing how to pronounce those. Camp there along the shore across from there, and the Pharaoh will think the Israelites are confused. They're trapped in the wilderness. Once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after you. I've planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites camped as they were told. <laughs> this, this order that, that God gave Moses came after the institution of Passover. It came after they did the, the law of the firstborn. It came after the ten plagues in Egypt. They'd already seen God work a miracle. They were out of Egypt. 
on their way to the promised land. But the, but the miracle that they were looking for hadn't quite happened yet. They're wandering in the wilderness. You know, they're, 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 they're camping between here and there, and then they come over here, and then they head back over there. And, 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 and I wondered, before I even got very far into this chapter, I wonder if Pharaoh had spies, or I wonder if they just had, like, people on the lookout at these towns about where are the Israelites? You know, I'm sure it was breaking news. I'm sure the Facebook feed and the tweets were going crazy when the Israelites were leaving Egypt. You know, and it's probably hard to hide a million or two million people in the wilderness. So I'm sure they didn't have to look very far to see where these people were moving. Uh, but I guess when, when God's people are on the move, people take note. I'm guessing that when a hundred million or two million people, hundreds of thousands of people are moving, that people wonder what God is up to, or they wonder why Pharaoh let somebody go. And you know, there's a verse uh, in the previous chapter, um, 13, 17, it says, when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through the Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said, if the people are faced with the battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. You ever feel like you've taken the long road to the promised land? Well, I'm telling you, sometimes it seems like God can lead you in the wrong way for the right reasons. That when you seem trapped in the wilderness, God may be setting you up for a miracle. So after they went over here, and then they came back over here, and then they went over there, Pharaoh thinks... They're lost in the wilderness. What did I do? I might as well go back and take my servants. That's free help. Somebody go get them, Israelites, and bring them back to Egypt. I, you know, he kept changing his mind again and again and again. So God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And, and God led the Israelites the long way around because they knew that even though they were on a spiritual high after leaving Egypt, that if they were to face battle, if they were to face the right amount of opposition, that they would crumble under the pressure. God led them in their wandering to confuse their enemy by making them think that they were confused. You ever done stuff and just thought, people must think I'm crazy. You know, like, I feel like the Lord is leading me to do something, and I go and I do it, and maybe it isn't what you thought the end result was going to be like. You know, we told you to do it. You just thought a different result was going to happen in the process. Well, I imagine that after they had gone from here to there and back to there, that they didn't know if God knew what he was doing either. But at that moment, God was hardening Pharaoh's heart, and he was setting them up for a miracle in the wilderness. And I'm telling you, when Pharaoh changed his mind, he broke an agreement. But when the Israelites changed their mind, you'll come to see that they were just doubting the promised land. They went out with boldness, verse 8 says. Uh, let, let's start back in verse 5. When the word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. What have we done letting all these Israelite slaves get away, they asked. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot and called up his troops. He took with him 600 of Egypt's chariots along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with its commander. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he chased after the people of Israel who had left with fists raised in defiance. Other translation says they marched out boldly. You know, if God does miracles on your behalf to deliver you from Egypt, you're going to walk with a little bit of strut afterwards. You're going to feel like God is on my side and I have nothing to fear. But what happens afterwards? What happens afterwards is that the Egyptians chased them after, chased after them with all the forces of Pharaoh's army. And I'm sure it wasn't a small army. 600 chariots. The chariots were probably like the captains that each had their own like regiment of troops. So this had to not be a small display of power. You know, Egypt was like the world power of this time. But, but, but the Israelites, although they came in small numbers under Joseph, that they began to multiply. And, and, and they were afraid that they might overthrow Egypt. So they t he had to take everything that he could to come against what he knew at one point was the Lord. But when God had hardened his heart, he went after the Israelites. And the, and the Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they were camped beside the shore of here and there. And verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up. 
I had to imagine what were they doing while they were camped there. Do you think that they were praising God? Do you think they were having church? Do you think they were maybe telling stories of the miracles yet? I don't know. But it says when they looked up, they panicked. They were filled with fear. And I imagine that's a lot like us whenever we've been delivered from hard situations. And we know God is on our side. We know that he's behind us, that he's for us, that he's fighting for us, and he delivered us from the promised land. But when Egypt comes knocking on your door again, you instantly panic. You're filled with fear. They saw that when the Egyptians came in the past, they were going to tell them that maybe they didn't have straw to make their bricks, but they still had to make a hundred million thousand bricks. And they just instantly had this reflex of fear, thinking, what are they going to do? Are they going to kill me? Are they going to beat me? Are they going to increase my workload? Am I going to be a slave again? Are they going to take my family? Am I never going to taste freedom? Am I never going to get away from this place called Egypt? You see, they had been crying out for a deliverer in Egypt. But when the deliverer came, they didn't really recognize him. I think many of us ask for the solutions to our problems, but we fail to recognize it when it comes because it doesn't come in the way that we think it will come. More than that, I believe sometimes when you're getting free, somebody testify, Teen Challenge, that when you're getting free, sometimes it feels like the oven gets a little hotter, that maybe the opposition comes in a little stronger, and that maybe when you think that the storm is raging the hardest and you might die is probably when you're going to get blown to your destination. Is that right? When Israel looked up, they panicked. They saw the Egyptians overtaking them. And they cried out to the Lord and said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Was there not enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. You see, when your deliverance doesn't come like you think it will, you start doubting the promise. And this next line just crushed me. It's the latter part of uh, verse 14. I'm sorry, verse 12. It says, it's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Does anybody feel like sometimes they'd rather just be a slave in Egypt? Do you ever doubt the promised land to the point where you think you're not going to make it and you'd rather just be a corpse in the wilderness? I believe that it's that reflex of fear that undermines your confidence in what God can do. That I don't think that, um, I think so many of us doubt the promised land, so we never choose to leave Egypt. We don't really see the provision in the wilderness. We don't really see God leading us through the wilderness, so we decide to stay in the comforts of Egypt, even though when we were crying out in Egypt and he sent us an answer, we chose not to believe that. I think what they say here, it's not really recorded in the previous chapters. It doesn't really say that they say that, but I imagine some of the people were actually thinking that. I imagine some people were thinking, what is this guy? This is an old guy that he had been tempered in, in the wilderness already for 40 years, and I'm sure that they doubted that he had any way to actually move the hand of the superpower of Egypt. I believe that it's fear that undermines your confidence in God. But the real key verse is that this next verse, it says, but Moses told the people. Now, see, that's what I realized that the Israelites, you see them waffling back and forth. You see that they don't really have that steady connection with God, and it makes a difference. Those who have the steady connection with God, they hear from the Lord and they speak on his behalf. You see Moses maintaining the connection with God while the Israelites are waffling Verse 13 says, Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Seems simple, right? It seems simple to just tell somebody, don't freak out. Don't, don't be afraid. I know there's 600 chariots coming at you, and you've been slaves for hundreds of years. And even though God told you that he's going to do something, who really knows if he's going to do it or not? It seems simple. Don't be afraid. 
just stand still. Stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. I think I could close the book and go home then after that, but what I really got from that, I looked it up in a couple of different translations. Some say stand firm, some say be still, some just say stay calm. But right after this, right after this, look what Moses says, or look what the Lord tells Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. So what I'm, what I'm asking here is you just told me to be still. You just told me to be still, but then you asked me, why are you crying out to me? God, God asked, why are you crying out to me? Because he had already paved the way. He already knew how he was going to get them out, but he said, you've got to get moving to get to that place. So that tells me that this stillness, this calm, this peace, it isn't an action, it's a stance. It's an attitude. So when you know God is on your side, when you know he's going to deliver you, when you know that the opposition is coming, then you have to stay still in your mind. You have to stand firm. You have to say, I'm not going to panic. I may not know exactly how we're going to get to the other side, but I know the God of Israel rescued us from Egypt. I've seen his mighty hand. I've seen him perform miracles on my behalf. So I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm trusting you enough to get moving. It's right after that Moses parts the Red Sea. I'm sure you've heard plenty of sermons on that, so I'll spare you the details. But look at verse 19. Then the angel of God. Every time it's talking about the angel of God, do you know who that is? Who's the angel of God? Jesus. So the angel of God. God, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the terminology, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. You see, that happens all throughout the Exodus story, where, where they know which way to go, they know when to move, whenever the pillar of fire by night moves, whenever the pillar of cloud is there in front of them, they know exactly which direction to go, they know exactly when to move and when to stay. But it says that he moves from in front to behind. I wonder if you're walking through the Red Sea right now, not knowing which direction to go. I wonder if you've just stood still in action and been panicking in your mind because the direction that you were going that you know the Lord was leading you to, all of a sudden you can't see direction. You know, it says right there that, that um, it got between the Israelites and the Egyptians. And it was light to the Israelites and it was darkness to the Egyptians. I'm telling you that sometimes when you're stuck in the middle of a trial and you don't see God moving you to the other side, he is lighting the way, but maybe he's just being your rear guard because it says the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. And that's the kind of darkness that confuses the enemy, that God may be confusing your enemy. Enemy. He may be leading you into the wilderness to confuse you to get glory for himself through your enemies. When the miracle came, the Lord stopped leading. Fear will have you doubt the answer. But confidence in God will keep you going in the straight direction, even whenever you don't see the Lord leading you step by step. You see, we see Moses can uh, maintain this, this connection with God. He's hearing from God. He's leading the people of God. But every time the Israelites come up against something, they cried out for a deliverer. And then when the deliverer came and made their job more difficult, they were complaining about not being able to get straw for their bricks. When they left Egypt in boldness with their arms raised up, yeah, then the immediately when they see the Egyptians again, their reflex is fear. Right after this story, they're, they're praising God for parting the Red Sea. And the next sentence, they're panicking about where they're going to get water from. 
And after God causes another miracle in the wilderness to give them water to drink, then they start complaining about food. And after they stop complaining about food, they get to the mountain of God and they get the Ten Commandments. And before they even get the Ten Commandments, they're already worshiping an idol. And then you get into the story of kings to where they want to be like other countries. And they say, God, give us a king. And then when they get a king, all they do is rebel. They split up and they get put into bondage. And time and time again, God proves his faithful love. And he comes and rescues them. And he says, you know what? I don't care that you betrayed me again. I don't care that you spit in my face. I don't care that you stopped moving when I told you to move, but I loved you enough that I sent a deliverer on your behalf and I want to rescue you from Egypt and you will not be a corpse in the wilderness. You're going to make it to the promised land. There may be people dying all around you. There may be a whole generation that doesn't see the promised land, but God is fighting for you that he is your rear guard and even when you don't see him leading you, he is backing you up. And when everything is going wrong and you think you're going to get overtaken by the Egyptians, all somebody has to do is wave their arms and praise God because the, the sea is about to come and cover the Egyptians. He said it, that when he rescues you, he's, you're never going to see these Egyptians again. My question is, are you still looking at your Egyptians? You may have moved out of Egypt, but did you leave a forwarding address? <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about my Egypt. I went through the program in most of 2014. I was a drug addict in jail. They're trying to charge me with um, trafficking, dealing, possession, whatever. And I had it coming to me. I had it coming to me. But that wasn't my real problem. My problem went a lot deeper than drugs. I, I think if you, if you sat and talked to any of these students today, you'd see the drugs was just the coping mechanism for them to deal with their storms. I was raised in a Christian home. I had no excuse to act the way I did. I knew better. But that didn't change the empty, gaping, hurting hole in my heart that I couldn't fill in this world. God parted the Red Seas for me to get into Teen Challenge, but that didn't mean I was in the promised land yet. He caused a miracle in my life for it to help me get into Teen Challenge, but the miracle happened while I was in Teen Challenge because, you see, I have an older sister. We didn't have a good relationship growing up, but something in me needed brothers to tell me that I was a man of God, to tell me that they loved me, and to believe in me for me when I couldn't believe in myself. You see, I had lived a homosexual lifestyle for over 10 years, and I didn't think that I could ever be a man of God, but whenever God got a hold of me and I saw him part the Red Sea I decided that it doesn't matter if I don't see miracles anymore that I'm gonna keep following and even if I don't know if he's backing me up that I'm gonna keep going and I don't care if I die in the wilderness because it's better to be free in the wilderness than to die a slave in Egypt and I'm telling you I may not have seen the promised land yet but I'm on my way I'm on my way and I don't care who chases after me because I have seen the Lord and I'm not going back are you going back today because I'm telling you your fear will keep you going into Egypt and your doubt will keep you in the wilderness but it's your faith in God that will keep you going towards the promised land and even if Moses doesn't make it there there might be two or three is there two or three in here that's gonna make it into the promised land because I'm telling you even when you get into the promised land there may be giants there may be fortified cities you may not know if you can take Jer Jericho but I'm telling you when you praise God the walls come down <laughs> don't be afraid just stand still watch the Lord rescue you
Many of us could rescue ourselves in difficult situations. I I was a pretty smooth talker back in the day, so I could talk my way out of a lot of tight situations. But I'm telling you, the anointing doesn't announce itself. But the anointing that is behind you is greater than the opposition in front of you. So that when God is fighting for you, you don't have to make it up. You don't have to fake it. It doesn't have to be emotionalism. You don't have to spend 40 years crying out to God in the wilderness for him for waiting for him to make a way for you you just know that if you have that stillness if you have that calm in your life then you know God is fighting for you and you know that he will get you to the other side even if it takes the long way around am I talking to people who are taking the long way around worship team if you'll come I want to pray for some people today and and I want I want y'all to hear some some team challenge testimonies up close and personal. I know some of y'all have, have family members. Maybe it's yourself that suffers with addiction. Uh, phase two, anybody come up here and I want y'all to just talk to some people and love on some people because we're, we're family here. And if you've got someone and you want somebody who has seen victory and who has tasted God, we've got some men and women of God that want to pray for you today. And, the, and I know that, my, that the same God that rescued me from Egypt can reach into Egypt and cause your loved one to be set free as well. Maybe it's fear that you're wrestling with. Maybe it's doubt that you're wrestling with. But I'm telling you, just adopt that mindset of standing still. Peace isn't the absence of action. Peace is the presence. Too many people think that stillness is just, just not anything going on. But I'm telling you, it's the presence of a person. And that's Jesus. And it took me a long time to grab a hold of it. But when you get a hold of it and you run with it, something happens. Don't be afraid. Just stand still. Just stand still. Watch God rescue you today. These problems you're having, these Egyptians you're looking at, these people that seem like they're going to take you down, God will take care of it. God will take care of it. Two. Yes. God, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for these, these stories of victory, God. Lord, I hear people crying out in the wilderness looking for their deliverer, God, and I know that you've sent people here today to tell them that the deliverer is here, that the king is among us, and that you want to set us free. God, I just pray for that anointing, God, that anointing that breaks yoke. God, come in this place and move on our hearts, God. We set it down, Lord. We lay down the burdens. We lay down the afflictions and the problems, God, that we know that you can take care of, God. We ask you, Lord. We ask you, God, that even though we don't see you leading us through, God, we know you're backing us. Lord, I just ask that you would come, God, free, free from the bondage of fear, free from the bondage of doubt, from the bondages of addiction, from the bondages of depression, God. You, you can set anyone free. I know if you've done it for us, you can do it for them. So, God, we invite you in this place. We invite you in this place, God. We thank you. We thank you for your grace that empowers us to live holy lives, to live lives consecrated to you, God. And even if we don't see the miracle, God, we know, we know that you will rescue us. Yes. Hallelujah. You're worthy, 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 Lord. Thank you, Jesus. you've got some prayer needs, I want y'all to come up and get prayed for. I want y'all to taste what God has done in these people's lives. I want you to see for yourself the imprint that God makes on these lives whenever he gets a hold of you. You know, he doesn't just touch lives and leave them the same. He changes them forever and you can see God's fingerprints all over these people. 
come forward if you need prayer. It, it can be for addiction. It can be for, for, for the bondages of fear or depression. Come. Come if you will. Come.